Hi, Misha here. And in my timeline, it's been a week or so since I've recorded videos, but since I record multiples in usually one or two days, you probably didn't notice a difference. And today, I thought we would talk about another Star Destroyer. In a couple of videos, I've covered the standard Imperial Star Destroyer, both the Mark I and Mark II. This is a toy model ship diecast from the old Titanium series, which kind of grew out of the Micro Machines. And in this video, you saw the title, we're going to talk about the Executor class. And I have two here. This is a relatively new one from the Hot Wheels collection, and this is an older one from the day Agostini. Both are diecast, but this is trending more towards Tori, and this is definitely more of a true model, although it's a miniature, kind of more in a collector's series. So let me set you down. And these come in these kind of neat little self-contained display cases with even a neat little backdrop. And they come with the magazine. So the De Agostini, while they were not cheap as such, were kind of a neat little value for 20 or so bucks. At least for a licensed product. And uh, because this is one of theirs, it's pretty much all pretty finely created die-cast metal. With maybe just a few plastic bits, for example, the... Uh, control tower up here which is very tiny that's because of the scale it's a uh, it's larger on the hot wheels but i think that's just so they can give it some detail in the old titanium line their executor is uh pretty small in the bridge area but i'll explain why i don't have a hot wheels I mean, excuse me a titanium in a bit so, names. First off, this does have a lot of names. The Empire called this the Executor class, and it generally fit into a group of ships they called Star Dreadnoughts. So, and up from Star Destroyer. In modern naval terms, well, I should say modern, 100 years ago, a destroyer was a small, fast ship, usually anti-submarine, at least in World War II, anti-aircraft in some cases, Whereas a Dreadnought was uh, an early battleship, of course, the HMS Dreadnought starting it off, but that was the first modern, true battleship. The Rebels, though, just called these as Super Star Destroyers, as a kind of catch-all term for something bigger than a standard Imperial. Now, not to spend much time on the Imperial here, but... And this one's uh, from the Black Series Titanium, which is a reissue of the old one. The original Imperial, seen in all the original films, is uh, 1,600 meters long. It has three main engines for backup, hi uh, Class II hyperdrive with a Class VIII backup. It has 60 turbo lasers, 60 ion cannons, a handful of point defense installations, 10 tractor beams, carries 72 TIE Fighters, standard, usually about half are standard TIE Fighters, the rest are specialized, and it carries uh, one single garrison base that can be rapidly deployed, and it can carry 20 AT-ATs, ATATs, and 30 ATSDs for ground assault, and these are expensive critters to make about 150 million credits in the Star Wars universe or about a dollar to make this die-cast ship. And the Empire started creating these shortly after its formation around 18 BBY before the Battle of Yavin and they would build upwards of 125, excuse me, 25,000, 125,000 actually be even better but 25,000, which seemed huge until you consider they had an entire freaking galaxy to monitor. They were expensive to build, expensive to maintain. They had a crew of roughly 
37,000, and they could carry nearly 10,000 stormtroopers. So fully laden, they could carry about 50,000 people and had enough consumables and fuel on board for two years before resupply. Now this, again, I typically like the titanium and black series models, but this one has a thing that I don't like. It has good detailing on the hull. This is all metal, but you'll notice this is wiggly and it's not just mine i've looked at three of these and they all are that's because it has an action feature if you look down here you'll see the bay and the idea is if there's a button in the back you can toggle up and that drops down this little tiny corellian corvette to kind of reenact the scene from a new hope Kind of just like it's there. It's a neat idea, and the Corvette is pretty neat for as tiny as it is. But the problem is to make this work, you can pull down a little further, but you have to make this center engine kind of wonky, and that means this bridge tower is a little wonky. When it's up, it's tight. When you push it down, which pulls the Corellian Corvette in, it's a little loose. And on top of that, you'll notice the bay is a little elongated from what it would be in the film. I just think for the action feature, which is a neat idea, they sacrifice too much. Having a wiggly bridge, kind of messing up your center engine, I think that's the biggest egregious thing. And then having this extremely elongated fighter bay. To be fair, the uh, die-cast model sold, or toy sold in the late 70s, 80s for the Star Destroyer also had a miniature Corvette. But that's why I don't have the uh, titanium. Instead have this uh, Hot Wheels for the Executor, because its action feature is a tiny little Star Destroyer that pops out to kind of show scale. And again, there have to be compromises to make it work. And I like this because it just doesn't have any features. It's just solid. Now it is pretty much all metal. Uh, the bridge is, I think, plastic. And the only real detraction, it's got a nice little trench on the side. And it has the usual screw holes that are in all of these. So underside is kind of eh. But the top and side view is pretty good. Says the blind guy. Now one thing people say is the coloration is more standard imperial. Which is true. This was a little wiggling on this carpet, sorry. It's more to match. The Star Destroyer, so to kind of make a cohesive fleet. Whereas in the film, it was a darker gray, almost blue, because of the lighting. So that's why I have the the De Agostini is kind of my uh, fine model here of it, and then I have kind of the Hot Wheels as more of a not play but display type. So that's my reasoning. Onto the ship. Well, the standard Star Destroyer, like I said, is 1,600 meters. How long is this? Well, that's a bit debatable, so let's come back to it. But we'll, we'll say it's bigger. According to Wikipedia and other sources, it has a crew of nearly 280,000. And it can support up to 300,000. Of those, about 38,000 can be stormtroopers. And it needs at least a minimum crew of 50,000 to work properly. So its minimum crew is larger than the Star Destroyer's maximum crew. Yeah. It can operate without resupply for six years. It has one giant reactor engine, which does kind of protrude out the bottom. It's said that it produces enough power to be equivalent to a small star 
and as if that's not enough, it has secondary and backup generators for either localized areas or, again, just backup. It has 13 primary engines in the back. I don't think it has an atmospheric top speed because I don't believe this is terribly atmospheric. The regular Star Destroyer's max speed is 975 kph, so if this has an atmospheric speed, you would expect it to be slower. Maybe like a TIE bomber at about 850. Uh, its hyperdrive is the same, Class 2, although its backup is uh, slightly slower. The uh, regular Star Destroyer has a Class 8 backup. I think I might have said Class 10 earlier. I apologize. Um, this has a Class 10 backup, so its backup's a little bit slower than the uh, standard Star Destroyer, but its primary hyperdrive is the same. What else? What else? Of its crew, nearly 1,600 are gunners alone, because this has a lot of guns. It has 2,000 turbo laser batteries and 2,000 heavy turbo laser batteries. It also has 250 concussion missile launchers with 30 missiles each, 250 heavy ion cannons, and 500 point defense batteries. Now the over 4,000 main lasers, turbo lasers, are kind of grouped in group of you know, units of eight, so multiple guns can be controlled by the same gunner. Otherwise, you would have uh, 6,000 gunners. So it definitely has a lot of firepower for what it is. It has multiple shield generators and it can carry a good amount. So let's talk about the role of this ship. Primarily, it is a command ship, a flagship. Secondary roles include being a carrier and battleship. And I mentioned this because it kind of explains something. With the Star Destroyer, we had 72 TIE Fighters. We had as many ion cannons as we did turbo lasers. And we had 20 AT-ATs and 30 ATSTs with one garrison base. That's because it has more of a offense and suppression role. While this can do the same thing, that's not really what it's there for. So it's, it's lighter overall on its ion cannons because it's not really going to be chasing much of anything. But on the other hand, it has more point defense and concussion missile launchers than a Star Destroyer because it wants to defend itself because it has high-ranking and valuable people on board. That's why its fighter capacity is standard at only 144, so only twice that of a normal Star Destroyer, but that's just standard. It does have three main hangar bays with several auxiliary, and it can hold hundreds, even thousands of small fighters if necessary. So it can be called upon to be more of a major carrier, it just usually isn't. Likewise, standard equipment for ground assault, just 30 AT-ATs and 40 AT-STs with two garrison bases. Again, that's just not really its primary use. So most of its weaponry is for defense, and most of its carrying capacity is either for stormtroopers or high-ranking officers, plus being able to just last in space for a very long time. It also has a very long-range sensor package, and it carries a great number of probe droids for detecting rebel scum. So that kind of gives you an idea of what it's really meant for. In fact, the top of it is often kind of called a cityscape because it has buildings and things, you know, space buildings. <laughs> and it is. It has more offices for logistics and things like that. And, of course, it even has its own transport train or tram system inside. So let's talk about the size. Well... That's a bit of a thing. Officially, it's 19,000 meters, 19 kilometers long today. But that wasn't always the case. When this was designed around 1979, 
for the Empire Strikes Back, it was actually meant to be about the same size as a regular Imperial Star Destroyer. Essentially, they took an Imperial and flattened it out. This is thicker. This is very thin. And the idea was this was going to be a rapid response, a high-speed Star Destroyer, kind of a new generation to respond to the destruction of the Death Star. But that quickly got axed. It quickly got scaled up. Uh, when they were producing Empire Strikes Back, 11 kilometers was kind of the rough scale they were using. And I think this continued on through uh, Jedi, too. And it was said, kind of in the script and other sources, that it was about five times as powerful, as capable as a standard Star Destroyer. But over time, this got expanded when the expanded universe and now even Disney canon has kind of embraced this 19 kilometer length. So it's been further scaled up. I honestly think 11 would have been about right. Because 16 would have been 10 times the length of a Star Destroyer. And that seems a bit much. But anyway, I digress. It is very flat, so I guess we can make excuses there. As far as in-universe, it ha has an equally interesting story, also involving the size. While the standard Imperial came about shortly after the Clone Wars, this took some time. And it was kind of a rival project for things like the TIE Defender and the Death Star. But the Emperor was in favor of it, so he secretly authorized the first four to be constructed, and this was several years before Yavin. Now the problem was, at this time, before Yavin, the Imperial Senate still had some authority, especially when it came to the budget and kind of vetoing expenses. So... It's said that the name Super Star Destroyer was kind of used in records to mask that this was a ginormous ship. Alternatively, it was given a length of 8 kilometers, which is still huge, but yeah, it seems smaller. In the real world, this happens too. The first example that comes to mind is the FA-18 Super Hornet, the... Uh, the E's, the F's, and the G's. And that was much the same reason in the 90s in America. To kind of get the Super Hornet approved, they just marketed it as, well, an improved Hornet. Where in reality, it shows, shows some components, but it's truly a new aircraft. In its case, it's only about 20-25% uh, bigger than the standard Hornet. So, not 10 times, but gives you the idea. And, of course, as the construction continued on the four executor class types, expenses went up, and so documents started to reflect a length of 12 kilometers to kind of keep up with the costs. We know that these were already well under construction by 3 BBY, and we're getting near completion when Yavin happened. So after the Death Star was lost, the first four were kind of rushed to completion. And the first two of those, including the executor herself, were commissioned about half a year, six months, after the Battle of Yavin. Now, fun fact, these were made by Kuwat, who does most of the Star Destroyers. In fact, the design was from the same brain, the same team that came up with the Vin Editor and Imperial Star Destroyers, so there's definitely a lineage there. But, Kuwat mostly produced the Executor. But towards the end, when it was 90% plus complete, the, imp the Emperor ordered it launched, which is something we do in the real world with ships, and for its final fitting out to be done at a different shipyard, Fondor. And my notes there say... It pissed them off. That's what I wrote down. Um, Fondor didn't like this because it took time away from their own projects and money. And they knew that Kuwat would still get the glory, the credit for designing the Executor. So why why do it? But the Emperor was playing political games. I know shock. Amazing that 
Palpatine. Sheev would do that. Anyway, by the end of the year of Yavin, two of these were in service, and before Hoth, which would have been three ABY, at least four were commissioned into the fleet. This would include the Executor and the, imp the Emperor's personal ship, the Eclipse. Later, the Ravager would also join, as well as the Adjudicator and several others. The Lusankia would be one from uh, the X-Wing series, too. So how many did the Empire have by the time of Endor? Of course, famously in Endor, this was lost to a single A-Wing crashing into the bridge. Now, to be fair, if the Death Star hadn't been there, it would have spun out of control in space for a bit, and command would have been regained, and it would have been no worse for wear aside from losing the Admiral. But because there was a giant space moon nearby with gravity of its own, it, uh, it crashed into it like a giant stiletto. They had 25,000 regular Star Destroyers. How many supers? Well, the Rebels estimated 12. Later, after the fact, Ad, uh, Grand Admiral Sloan estimated 13. So 12 or 13 were in service by the, around the time of Endor, because they'd really cranked up construction after the loss of the Death Star and before the second Death Star was near completion. However, by the Battle of Jakku, many of these had been lost. Um, at least five had been destroyed by the rebels, soon to be New Republic. Another three had been captured by various parties, including I think one was captured by pirates. And this might seem ridiculous, but keep in mind, this was a command ship expected to be escorted by multiple Star Destroyers. So if it lost some of its escort, plus it needed a crew of uh, over 200,000, and this might have been hard to do, plus the fuel. So I could see ones after indoor being less than fully uh, combat capable and whatnot. And keep in mind, the guns were manually aimed, so if they didn't have 1,600 well-trained gunners... Well, yeah, welcome to the Star Wars universe, where we have lifelike droids, but we don't have automated computers that can shoot. Those are the Wookiees, I guess. <laughs> so eight of the 1213 were already lost. On top of that, the Eclipse disappeared. The Emperor's. So that's gone. And then the Ravager was lost at Jakku, quite famously uh, seen in several games and Force Awakens. Lake so after this and 5 ABY, 10 of the 12 or 13 Super Star Destroyers were gone. The remaining 2 or 3 were highly prized by Imperial Remnant Warlords and would continue to harass the uh, New Republic for some time to come. However, the extremely high operating cost and crew and demands and maintenance and everything else, it's one thing, I mean, how many shipyards could even uh, repair and refurbish and resupply something like this? So they were wearing out, and then that made them much easier targets, and then the New Republic would pick the, the last ones off. And it goes without saying, after Endor, pretty much construction was over when it came to Super Star Destroyers, uh, Executor class. Star Dreadnoughts, because they just couldn't afford it. There might have been one or two more launched that were nearing completion, but no new hulls were laid down, no new keels. As far as the Eclipse, yeah, but it actually popped back up in the Unknown Territories and kind of interact with the First Order and all that jazz. But this is traditionally an original trilogy ship, so we'll keep it there. And it was done to give old Darth Vader, which of course was the commander, at least ultimately so, even if some admirals thought they were the commander of Executor, gave him a big ship to pounce around the universe in. And it was escorted by five to seven, even sometimes eight, normal Star Destroyers. And it didn't need escort, much like any battleship. It was just too big, slow, and cumbersome to go on its own. 
basically it is Spaceship Yamato. And it's always been an interesting ship of mine. There weren't really a lot of toys or whatever of this in the 80s. And there was the Micro Machine in the 90s. But back when it came out, it was an exclusive. If you had to buy the whole set at like Toys R Us or wherever. So I never had the Micro Machines of it. But that's essentially what this is. Now this is the, the Hot Wheels, which is a different mold. But the Titanium kind of grew out of the Micro Machines mold. That's why it had kind of the action feature of the tiny little Star Destroyer. And then, of course, Titanium turned into Black Series Titanium, which I don't know if they've done a super. Uh, the Black Series seems pretty quiet at the moment, so could be wrong. But hey, it was a big old ship, and I thought it deserved a big old video. And it's an interesting piece of uh, Star Wars lore. And whereas things like the Death Star and some of the other giant super weapons in Star Wars are absolutely ludicrous, this is somewhat believable. Because if you're going to have mile-long Star Destroyers that are considered destroyers, having a giant command ship that you just make a dozen of for the entire galaxy, it makes sense. There was a time when you had giant battleships roaming Earth, like the Yamato and... Uh, the Nelson and the Rodney and the Iowa classes and so on and so forth. And that's what these are. These are definitely prestige command ships. They are not frontlined primary battleships. And it shows in their features. Although it would have been kind of cool to see one kitted out as a full carrier. To see just how many little TIE fighters it could carry. Because in this size, if they did it, yeah, thousands could fit on board very easily. But instead... It was given posh rooms for admirals and conference rooms, and it's even been said that these all had imperial throne rooms on board, and just in case the emperor deigned to pay them a visit. So yeah, I just wanted to share these with you. If you have any questions or comments, please do let me know. Thank you very much. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.